Hey, good night to everyone. Once again, we are here um, to spend a moment with you. Um, it's always a privilege and an honor to be able to sit and speak with those of you who will give us your attention tonight. Um, Wednesday, as you would be accustomed by now, is that moment when we sit and talk about um, very pertinent issues in relation to our Christian experience, our walk with God. And tonight we want to um, address one of those areas as well. And um, if you are sharing with us tonight, we ask you to also please share this live, share this link with someone so that they can connect with us. And we always say to you, if you do have questions, feel free to text them and uh, our moderator is going to send those questions to us and we will respond to you as you would have um, requested. So tonight we thank you for giving us your time and your attention. I am here on set tonight. You're familiar with me. You know me very well by now. And I'm um, Pastor Abedin. And um, my assistant here working with me tonight is a sister, Janelle Marvin. And um, we are going to have a healthy discussion, interesting discussion. And um, she is an educator. She knows her stuff well. And she's going to spend time with me tonight as we talk about the issue of brokenness. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, brokenness. Uh, because we recognize it's an area that we were discussing off air. And we were talking about so many people are in our world today and they are broken. And some might be broken and not be aware. Some might be broken and might be aware of it and struggling with their own broken experiences. And um, we want to talk to that issue and about it tonight. And we also would like to present solutions. How, uh, because God doesn't want us to stay broken. Um, the Bible says Jesus, as he spoke, he says he came to heal the broken hearted. And so he doesn't want us to be broken. He wants us to be whole. And um, that's what we want to um, eventually guide you into tonight. How to come out from your broken experience and experience wholeness in God. And um, we want to uh, use from our the scripture tonight, a uh, text from Second Samuel, very familiar person and portion of scripture for, uh, by now to you. Uh, we want to talk, uh, read from Psalm, uh, Second Samuel, sorry, chapter 4, and from verse 1 it says, And when Saul heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands, and the name of one was Bena, and the other was Rika. And the sons of Rimon, a Beerotite, of the children of Benjamin. And let me read from verse 4. It says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. For he was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up, and she fled. And it came to pass that as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. And David is now sitting on the throne as king and remembers Jonathan's kindness to him. So when David has now been established as king, in 2 Samuel 9, 1, the Bible says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Are you Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any of the house of Saul that I might show kindness, the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, unto the king, Jonathan had yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machib, the son of Amiel in Lodibah. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machib, of the son of Amiel from Lodibah. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said unto Mephibosheth, And he answered him, Behold thy servant, and David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore you all the land of Saul your father, 
and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, Why is thy, what is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I give unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servant shall till the land for him, and you will ensure, I'm paraphrasing here, that the fruits and the master's son have much food to eat, but Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. And so I will stay here tonight because there's so much more to read, but I don't want to read everything for the sake of time. And I'm looking tonight, as I said, at a very uh, unique gentleman in scripture uh, that we talk about. His name is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son, the son of Jonathan. Jonathan and David had a very close relationship. Jonathan was Saul, who was Israel's first king. Jonathan was Saul's son. And himself and David developed a very close relationship. And because of the kindness that Jonathan would have shown to David, David felt that he owed some kind of gratitude to Jonathan. Um, so the Bible tells us after Jonathan would have died, um, David is now reigning as the king in Israel, and he's wanting to show that kind of kindness to Jonathan's household. So he, recovered, he asked the question, is there anybody from the house of Jonathan, or Saul's house, that I might still show kindness? And the Bible tells us that um, it was told him that there was one gentleman who was by the name Mephibosheth, and he was living in a place called Lodibah. And he was called to David's presence. When he came to David's presence, the Bible says that when David spoke to him, he could not have appreciated the fact that David was wanting to elevate him and show him that kind of kindness. Because after his experience, now let me just share with you, Mephibosheth was born a, a proper child. Everything was working well for him. When he was born, his limbs, his legs, his hands, everything was functioning well when he was born. But Saul's house was in trouble. And the maid one day understood that Saul's house is now in a place of danger. And so she wanted to save Mephibosheth from danger. She took him up in her arms and was running away from the danger, trying to save him. But while she was running, Mephibosheth fell from her hands. And the Bible tells us that he became lame in his legs. And now he was crippled. But he was born well. But now he was crippled as a result of that fall. And now he is living in a place called Lodiba. David is now wanting to show him kindness. But because of his experience in life, he cannot seem to come to that place where he can appreciate what David wanted to do for him now. I'm saying to you that we can conclude that Mephibosheth was living a life where he felt a sense of brokenness. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Mephibosheth felt uh, as if he was less than human, less than a person. He did not feel as if he could have measured up with everybody else. And because he felt less than, because he lacked that sense of self-confidence and that sense of self-esteem, because he struggled with that, and he had difficulty in coming to terms with what had happened to him, he now chose to live in a place quiet by himself and was not in a position in his mind to appreciate what David wanted to do for him because he did not see himself as qualified to receive that kind of favor. And so myself and uh, my co-host here, um, Sister Jenna, is going to discuss those things as it relates to uh, persons or people. As we look at life, our understanding is that not only Mephibosheth finds himself in this kind of experience, but I'm recognizing that there's a whole host of human beings, if not all of us, who have had broken experiences, who came from different experiences in our lives. And one will tell me that even uh, persons who have made it should what we call big, and persons who have done very well in life, a whole lot of them would have been coming from some broken experiences, but the only time they were able to excel was when they were able to deal with that broken experience. In fact, some of them, it is by dealing with their brokenness 
They were able now to use those things as platform, the experiences as platform to cause them to excel. And God sometimes, um, I, I would have said last week, and I, I always say to folks, we are not responsible for what happens to us. Mephibosheth was not responsible for what happened to him, Mr. Children. He was born and he, the expectation is that he would have been properly taken care of. In fact, the maid who was running with him really had good intentions. She was wanting to secure him, protect him from danger that was imminent. And the Bible tells us that he fell from a hand. And having fallen, that affected his life in a great way. And we are saying that there's a whole lot of people whose life has been affected because of a whole lot of experiences that they've gone through. Could you share with me some thoughts, or if you're willing to share with us at this point in time, some thoughts with respect to that? Okay, good night, everyone. Yes, so truly, um, well put, Pastor. We are like, when we can find ourselves like Matthew Bushet, finding ourselves feeling as if we are unworthy, finding ourselves feeling as if we are not important, and these things, like Mephibosheth, cripple us from fulfilling the purpose of God. It can tend to rub, up, rub, up, rub off so much on us that it affects our mindset, our mentalities, how we perceive life, how we perceive the world, whether or not we're going to achieve, what we can achieve, what can we do. And it cripples us in that status whereby we don't see ourselves progressing. All we can see ourselves is just taking a back seat lying down in the back there like in Lodibar, you know, resting there until we're ready to die. You know, seeing ourselves not important. Even in the kingdom of God, we can find ourselves experiencing those things, you know. But uh, we are here even in this discussion, I was saying to pass is a very, very important discussion because it's something that needs to be dealt with. If we do not deal with these things, finally changing our mindsets as to seeing ourselves of where we are, you know, we too can find ourselves not fulfilling the plan and purpose of God for our lives because we are crippled by these things that have kept us and held us back, you know, our brokenness. But we, there is power in the blood of Jesus and there is power in the name of Jesus and God has come to set us free from these Lodibar experiences, this state of crippledness. And, you know, as we go forward in tonight's um, session, we see how that can be accomplished. Yes, Tajina, quite true. Um, I just want to read for you. Um, it says, because we live in a sinful, irrational, and imperfect world, and of course you would understand that, every one of us comes to adult life with some kind of damaged areas in our personality. Since we all bear emotional scars, and some carry many more or deeper scars than others, but all of us bear some damaged areas in our personalities. And in today's world, emotional disturbances have increased greatly, and you would understand why. It says the rise of divorces, and you look in our world, and you will understand that divorce has been on the rise all across the globe. Um, the rise of divorces and broken homes, or a tragic overemphasis on sex to the point where it has become almost a national obsession with us. The increase of illegitimate births, the growing use of alcohol and drugs and the breakdown of discipline and personal responsibility and the specter of parents who are just too busy or preoccupied to parent. Those, these are some of the results that factor and factors that con contribute to the development uh, of damaged personalities in our society. And all of those things that we talk about, we mentioned here. You would understand, those of you who are listening to us, and of course, and said this to um, Janelle, that broken homes, that drugs, that alcohol, and indiscipline, um, illicit sex that leads to births that people are not um, ready for in terms of parenting, and sometimes the busyness of parenting, the demand on parents, and all of these things contribute towards broken experiences in the home. And children grow up out of that experience. They find themselves challenged in life to deal sometimes with the realities that are presented before them. And as, those, as it relates to the world, but let, let's look at as it relates to those of us in church, Christians. Sometimes um, we get saved, we come into Christianity, but while I'm in church, 
I remember some time ago talking about folks who might be in church, you know, we're praising God, we're dancing, we, we're going through all of those experiences, which is good for us as such. But while I'm doing that, somewhere on the inside, I am still struggling with a sense of brokenness because I'm coming out from a home that was broken. I'm coming out from a home where there was abuse. I'm coming out from a place where drugs and alcohol was, should I say, a normal experience. And coming out from that, it manifests itself now in my own experience. And I'm struggling to deal with um, some of the negatives or the fallouts that came out of that experience. Um, and we said, then there are a whole host of negative things. Let me just highlight um, uh, firstly one of them. Uh, we said, coming out of those experiences, we have the effects of damaged emotions. Persons experience damaged emotions. And today's society, um, where we are seeking to produce, as it says, mass production of a whole generation who might, uh, of psychologically unstable youths who are soon to become parents, it would be possible to note every type of emotional damage experienced in our society. But the following are some of the emotional damages that people can suffer coming out of some of those experiences. And the, one, the first one we would like to highlight tonight, people struggle with a deep inferiority feeling. That is an inner nagging sense that you are not good enough, that you will never amount to anything, that no one could possibly ever love you, that everything you do is wrong, always a continual sense of anxiety and fear and what do you think that somebody who lives in that kind of experience i'm saying yes born again in my spirit do you think that that's going to create a struggle for persons of that nature to serve god and to fully function in the place in which god would have called them to function most definitely pastor because of the fact that these are emotions that are inside of an individual that is what you know, propels an individual to do what they do. That is what influences an individual to react or to respond to different situations given once presented to them. But in the kingdom of God, we come with these issues of brokenness. And as I was saying before, these things can tend to stifle us from fulfilling the plan of God. Because if I don't feel as if I'm good enough, or if I'm not worthy enough, therefore that I, I can eventually see myself not really wanting to do anything. I'm afraid to launch out because I'll always be afraid that someone is gonna ridicule me. You understand? Or whatever I have to offer to, to, to God, to sit here and you know, to speak on behalf. You know, I would feel myself as if I'm unable to do that because People are, of my thoughts, I'm going to think always that people are always going to see negativity from me. I'm not doing it good enough. Whatever I have to offer is not good enough, you know. But those things have to be dealt with. We have to deal with those issues because, of course, Christ came to redeem us from these things. We, 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 we are supposed to be, you know, renewing our minds daily. One way in which we can do that is by renewing our minds, only the word of God, by our consistent surrender to God and to his word. That is, to my belief, is what is going to help us to overcome those dark areas in our lives. Persons who struggle with insecurity and that kind of inferior complex, um, and who came out from a background where there was that kind of distrust, do you think it would be easy for them to trust God and if to trust people or persons in the kingdom? Well, I think that, um, okay, I can relate to myself, uh, my personal testimony as an individual. I grew up in a broken home with broken situations. My father was not there. He left us at the age of three. I was only three years old when he left us. And I had to see, grew up with a single parent, and I had to see my mom struggle throughout to take care of us. You understand? And those areas of brokenness I found as an individual, and that came again by how I was cultured as a child. I was taught how to pray. You understand? I was taught to go to the foot of the cross, you know, to talk to God. And from a child growing up, I used that. That is what supported me. That is what was my foundation, actually you know, to help me, to see me through in my state of brokenness. I remember that, uh, you know, I'm the type of individual, I cannot keep things inside of me. If I'm hurting, I would, I would prefer to talk about it. I cannot bottle it inside of me or else I'll explode, you know? So every time something affected me as a child growing up, 
I would run to God and I would talk to God about it, whatever, like a person, I would just, you know, find that place and just talk to God openly and express my thoughts to him. And to me, that is what helped me as an individual to, you know, to go past my, my, my brokenness and find myself to a place well, okay, of healing. You understand? Because I would cry to God and say, Lord, this is hurting me. I need healing here. Heal me, Lord. I need your healing. And that's how I would have experienced my healing, you know, through that situation. So yes, a person can overcome this thing, this, this sense of brokenness. Um, as, as you made mention of the fact that, you know, there was no father there from age three. Um, may I just ask a bit, um, because you said, when you would have gone through stuff, you were taught how to go to God and see Him, should I say, as Father, and um, relate to Him in that context. Now, could you speak to that particular situation again for those who may be growing up right now, they don't have fathers, there, is, there are no fathers there. And because we see a lot of homes that are broken, as you said, and there are no fathers there. But persons are living in that environment and they, they, they seem to struggle with the fact that there are no daddy or fathers there that they can relate to in a certain kind of way. And um, could you speak to those who might be struggling with those issues as um, a lack of father in the home? How should they treat with the issue of that nature? Yes, yeah, certainly. And again, to you who may have been growing up like, who would have grown up like me or maybe still in that process, you know, you are not without hope and you are not alone. You are not alone. I found God to be my Abba Father. My father was alive, yes, he was alive, but he was never there for me. But I found that Father in God. I, I anchored myself in God. He, he became my everything. He became my source of strength. He became my peace. He became my refuge. I made him. I chose to make him my refuge. I chose to make him my hiding place. Instead of running, you know, I could have been a, 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 a um, what's the word, a lawless child growing up. I could have. I had the opportunity to do that. Boys came around. I could have been a promiscuous child if I chose to do so. But because I made God my hiding place, because I ran to him, I didn't run to my friends. I didn't run to the wrong counsels, but I ran to him. And that is what kept me as an individual. And if, it kept, if, if God kept me through those trying times of my life, even up until t today, he can certainly keep you. You are not without hope. There is hope in the man Christ Jesus. That is where I found my hope and I offer that hope to you because I know that hope has worked for me throughout my life, even up until today. And even when I'm disturbed in my situations, I run to him because I've learned how to make him my strength and my shield. When, when my mind feels un, uh, uh, um, not at ease and I need peace, I run to him for peace. You know, of course you would feel broken and of course you would feel the pain. Of course there were many times when I've cried out to God and there were many times I felt broken in my spirit and I felt like giving up and I felt like quitting. Of course, surely it was never an easy road. But truly, throughout the entire process, I have found that every single time when I go to God, I would find that peace, a peace that really passes all understanding. And that is what kept me through it all. And if you can do it for me, certainly he can do it for you. That's right. That's quite true. I want to also um, focus on uh, two things. One of the things that as, uh, as we on this area of inferior feelings and so on, and you just never would measure up, you're just never adding up as such. Um, one of the, the uh, two or three things come to my mind in terms of what a father really does for a child, son or daughter. A father gives them validation. A father gives them a sense of identity. And a father makes them feel a sense of belonging and comfort and all of these things that a father presents them. Now, in the absence of that, as you say, that you have found God to be the one who, when, when nobody else makes you feel as if you're good enough, you are saying that God would have made you, um, give you that kind of confidence that you need in this life to feel as if, well, look, there's nobody who uh, I need to depend on to validate me. Once my father says I'm good, that's it. And um, 
there's a whole lot of people who can't seem to come out of that experience and they're struggling inside there. And they may not have had that verbal validation from their parents coming out. And they're struggling in their own experience still with that sense of inferior feeling. I'm just not good enough. I don't know how, you know, and they're struggling with self-esteem and all of those things because on the inside there's a brokenness. Now the healing, as you rightly said, comes uh, from God. The source of healing comes from God alone. He's the only person who can heal you from that. And of course, um, there are other areas, because I, I don't want us to spend all the time just talking about that. And as we talked about, one of the things that persons go through from emotional damage and so on, uh, while they're treating with, um, with that lack of confidence and so on, there is this other area in which sometimes brokenness manifests itself. Um, it's called the perfectionist complex. And that says the inner feeling that no matter what you do, you can never achieve adequately. You can never do enough. You are never able to please anybody, especially yourself. And you're always grouping, always striving, always feeling guilty, always driven by a terrible sense of oppression. You are perpetually climbing, but just never arriving. And that says that somebody who's struggling with that kind of experience, when you get saved, you feel that you are, you are never going to please anybody. And you come into the kingdom, and I remember you making mention of that earlier. You come into the kingdom, and you're asked to do something. For instance, you're doing what you're doing here tonight. And you probably could have responded and said, you know what? I don't think I can do that. Um, I don't feel adequate enough to do that. And um, even though you, I know that you have the capability, I, I can see that ability in you. But yet, in your own mind, you can't seem to bring yourself to that place to believe that you have the ability to do such. Could that become a setback in the life of a person from they making any kind of progress and development as they're supposed to? Most definitely, Pastor. Again, like Mephibosheth, it can tend to cripple you. See, these thoughts, your emotions can control you. All right. So if you have a sense, a deep sense of inferiority, or if you're a perfectionist where you believe that whatever you do, you know, it may never be measuring up to whatever standards that you believe that others may have, that can definitely cripple you because it controls your mind. Your emotions tend to control how you respond to situations, how you respond to God. But one way in which we can overcome these emotions that seeks to control us is by asking God to sit and reign on the throne of our hearts by surrendering. That's what I found from experience. Whenever I would have felt any measure of inferiority, I would surrender and say, Lord, you know, Lord, help me. Lord, give me the grace to do it. And then again, if it is, you know, as a child of God, what I really want to say is that whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord. And I know that is easier said than done. But you surrender it and you see it as doing it unto God. So you want to please God. Your desire is to please God and not to man. And again, this comes again by you transforming your mind by the word of God. I remember at some point in time, you know, uh, uh, as a teenager, I remember, you know, feeling feelings of inferiority. And I had to speak to myself. And what did I speak? I spoke the word of God. I went into I went into the word of God and I remember this always being I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I always spoke that into my life. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, O Lord, and that my soul knoweth right well. That's Psalm 139. So I went into the word of God and I found what God said about me. And I began to speak those things into my life. And I found that it started to transform the way that I operate the way that I saw myself and that's from my experience so it is your relationship with God that brought you into this place where you feel that sense of confidence yes most definitely um, and not just really depending on people to give you that kind that's of right. validation as it were and um, this would be saying to you tonight that coming out of your relationship when you get saved when you become a Christian um, because as we were saying before, all of us are coming from different experiences. Uh, our backgrounds and sometimes our bringings and our experiences in life can be very, very difficult. Um, last week and just before we came on set, I was making mention of um, this lady that I read so much of her books and looking at her life. 
um, Joyce Meyer. And um, you look at her standing on platforms today and she's talking and sharing her, um, talking with people with that kind of boldness and that kind of confidence. And um, you listen to her history and you understand that in order for her to do that and to do it with the kind of boldness and have the kind of impact that she's having, it had to come from a relationship that was greater than one just with mere men. It had to come from a relationship with one who knows how to make us whole. And you can glean from her experience that because of her connection with God, that puts her in the position now to be able to effectively minister to people in the way that she does. And we are saying that God is not um, Sister Joyce Myers, um, let me use this term, Godfather. He, she's not more privileged than any other Christian that there is in the world. So the point is, we are saying just like Joyce Meyer and a whole host of people, I'm just using her because there's a whole host of persons who God has healed and of course has brought them through all kinds of experiences. I know folks who have raped and gone through all kinds of stuff and they're serving, doing things today and you see them, you hear them and you will never think that they had that kind of historical experience. But they're doing what they're doing today because God has been healing them and has healed them in their emotions from their broken experiences. And I usually look at things like this. Eh? Sometimes we, as I said before, we are not always responsible. We're not really responsible for what would have happened to us prior to us coming into the kingdom because our lives were so messed up. But God have a way in which he uses our broken experience to become sometimes um, means by which we can minister to other people and persons who might be in that broken place and do not despise the fact that you might be broken now because persons might be in that broken place right now that you coming out from that experience can now become uh, effective in ministering to them because when you can speak to somebody that's why i love how you put your own personal experience touch into this because coming out from your experience you can now speak to persons and let them know this is how i was able to overcome this particular thing you're able to stand before a crowd and speak today, which um, maybe you may not have been able to do um, earlier in your life. And, but now you're able to speak to persons and speak with that kind of confidence and boldness because God has been healing you and healed you in certain areas of your life. So now you have a level of confidence as a person. And this is what we, 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 we are wanting to promote to you and have you understand that when you get saved as a Christian, it is not to stay in that broken place. But the Bible tells us as we speak about Jesus earlier, the Bible says one of the statements Jesus made is that he came to heal the broken hearted. And everywhere there are broken heart, hearts, Jesus' intention is to heal them. And sometimes the healing process doesn't happen suddenly. Sometimes the healing process can be gradual. Um, tell me what your thoughts are on in terms of how the healing can happen gradual, suddenly. How, how was it for you? Most definitely. The healing, again, because it's emotions you're dealing with. Um, to me, it didn't happen immediately in most instances. It took a period of time. But what I found is that like in the state of brokenness, there were many times I'd go before God and I'd just be crying crying out to God and expressing to him my feelings of brokenness. And you know, as a young, I, as you were speaking there past, I reflected as a young Christian when I now newly came into the kingdom. You know, I had a lot of zeal for God and so on. And yet I found, you know, we spoke about the spirit of offense and I found that, you know, I didn't get that much support from my elderly Christian brethren in the house of the Lord. There were many things that were said about me. There were many things that were said to discourage me. I would hear it back. And, you know, those things kept me broken as a, as a, as a young Christian growing up in the house of the Lord. But I did not allow it. I'm not saying that I never had feelings of bitterness or unforgiveness. Those propelled feelings of bitterness, those propelled feelings of unforgiveness, they you know because I would say I came into this kingdom and here I'm here having brethren ill speaking me speaking say she's proud who does she think she is and those kinds of things and those things hurt 
you know and i remember just going before god time after time and saying lord this is i don't want to do anything in your kingdom if i have to just be a doormat in your house that's okay with me you know but i just wanted god to heal me because i don't like being unhappy i'm not the type of person who likes to be unhappy i always like to smile and be joyous you know so i would cry out to god and say lord heal my brokenness heal my wounds lord this is the place where i'm at and over time pastor over time it didn't happen and even with my father i had to find a place of forgiveness to him because everything every negative thing that came into our lives i blamed him you know but because i continually went before god and spoke to him and said lord i want my heart to be right with you heal my brokenness help me to forgive lord help me to love people help me to reach out to people i continually surrendered to him and because of that I can say my father is now past, but before he passed, I was able to have a good relationship with him because God healed my brokenness. And that, and that took time to heal. It didn't just happen like that. But again, because of surrender, Lord, because I wanted healing. I wanted that healing for me. I didn't want to stay in a state of unforgiveness. I didn't want to be in the house of God and be upset with brethren and be unforgiving to brethren. I didn't want to feel that way. So I cried out to God daily, daily, daily. Lord, change my heart, oh God. Make it ever new. Make it be more like you. And you know, I've seen God. I've seen the power of God being able to work in and through my heart. You know, so that's how it took time. It takes time. I listen to you speak, and I say I couldn't choose a better person to come and spend this time with me tonight. <laughs> so that we can talk about this. Because you know what I love about life is that I think sometimes as preachers, um, what we have not done really is really told. Sometimes we don't always tell people all the, let me say all the truth. And um, I use that guardedly from the perspective that, you know, we go through stuff. We would have gone through things. And um, sometimes we don't tell persons what we would have gone through. And they see you doing stuff, and they tell themselves, well, um, you probably would have never gone through certain things. Because they see you in a certain kind of, um, um, in a kind of po um, position now. They see you doing things, they, see, they hear you speaking in a certain way, and they tell themselves, you know, I, I'm wondering sometimes, if I'm speaking about that, you know, my mind just reflects on when God told Moses to go and, 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 and speak to Pharaoh and say, tell him, let my people go. Moses' excuse to God was, Lord, I can't speak. But later, somewhere you find Moses speaking a lot. The same Moses who I cannot talk, he was now speaking. And so I think sometimes, uh, how did Moses overcome or come to that place where he was now in that bold, confident place to speak? Um, and persons sometimes see you doing things and they don't know what you have gone through. And we have not told them that sometimes as preachers. I remember in my own Christian world, growing up as a Christian, uh, just yesterday I was reading an article. And reading from that article, I remember going through a particular phase of my Christian life. And uh, a guy from reading his experience says, look, I did a particular sin so much time that I didn't, at a certain point in time, I didn't want to go and ask God for forgiveness anymore because I said, what am I going and ask him for forgiveness again? Because it, it, I just asked him that not too long and I'm going to ask again, so I'm going to be wasting time. And so you go through stuff in your life and you're fighting with stuff. And sometimes people see you now and they don't know the struggles you would have had, the things that you would have come through to put you in that place not to be able to speak. And sometimes we need to more or less tell people all of these things that you're saying. My father was this, I went through that, I was raised in, I, I go through stuff and all kinds of things. And so when people understand that you are coming from a very practical, real place, they can probably say to themselves, listen, if God was able to do that for you, he can also do it for me. And that's what we say to you tonight. You don't have to stay broken. You don't have to stay in that place where you're serving God, but you're struggling with insecurity. 
You're serving God, but you're struggling with that inferior complex. You're feeling less than somebody else that you don't measure. You're serving God, but somehow you feel that whatever you do is never going to really fully be accepted by people. And even sometimes when somebody would speak a negative thing, let's say you do something, and somebody would speak a negative thing about the thing that you did, you might say to yourself, look, I'm never going to do that again because you felt offended and you felt very bad about the experience. But I'm saying to you, do not allow experiences of that nature to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. Because there is a calling on your life, there is a plan for your life, there is a purpose for your life. And whatever God has determined for you to do, I'm saying sometimes people can do some very dangerous things to you. And one of the obstacles that you always have to look out for in your life is people. People can be good to you, but people can also be bad to you. And you have to know where to put people in the right perspective because um, people could have made Saul a great king, but people also destroyed Saul. The same people moved him to go against God, and so you have to be cautious when you allow people to speak negative things and affect your spirit in a, in a negative way. Our time is running very quickly. Um, one of the areas in which um, we would have also highlighted in, um, the third area that we would want to highlight tonight is that sometimes people can become broken and one of the manifestations of that brokenness is that they are super, they become super sensitive and we would have kind of touched it a bit. Um, it means one who is usually has been deeply hurt and they reach out for love, approval and affection but life has given them the opposite and scars have developed on the inside deeply. They see things to which others are blind. They feel things to which others are insensitive. And they are shattered by perfectly normal or accidental happenings. They feel that people are against them and they tend to interpret every casual happening in this light. They need constant reassurance. And there are people who live like that. Um, I sometimes refer to them as being very skeptical about everything. They're so uh, really super sensitive. For instance, uh, if you are so super sensitive, I, I just watch you, and just by that watch, you read all kinds of stuff into that watch, and you feel more or less, I oh, wonder what is thinking about me. You know, all kinds of things are happening in your mind. And that's why I'm, I'm not thinking, I might be thinking something beautiful about you. But in your mind, because you are so super sensitive, and you're thinking, um, negative in your mind, you might be thinking something wrong. And so there are a whole other people who are so easily, easily offended, super sensitive, and every little thing that they're affected by negatively. Um, could you speak to that particular issue as it relates to your observation? Have you seen things, because you're an educator, you have been in the school, have you seen manifestations of that experience even in the classroom among students? Most definitely, Pastor. Um, I would have had situations, you know, within recent times with my students, some of them, because again of what they have been through and the wounds that would have been inflicted upon them. You know, you can't talk to them. Did they see love as something wrong or something strange? You know, I remember a student saying to me, Miss, why do you care? Why do you care? And that brought my, you know, that, that, that raised my alarm. Why, why would you ask me why do I care? Caring is something that is supposed to be a natural response, you know? And um, it's like they, they think that I am bothering them because I care. I am doing them a bad thing because I care, you know? And I've seen students not being able to rise up to their full potential in the classroom because of this thing called brokenness you understand it has kept them down it has you know it has crippled them again like Mephibosheth you know feeling as if I don't need to try I don't need to I'm already a failure so what it was indeed I remember it actually literally begging students come by my desk come let me help you let me help you if you do not understand this problem let me help you let me work with you I am willing to work with you but they just don't want to pass. I've seen that and I could not understand it. They can't respond because, again, of this, probably what would have been said to them, you're a no good, you, you can't make it, you're a failure, you understand? So therefore, they don't see the need inside their minds. Why would I even bother to try? You understand? And that's a 
theater is a serious, serious thing. It's from a child, you grow into an individual in society, you may become a husband, you may become a wife, whatever the situation is, and then that will transcend into your marriage. And then you become the parent now who can't even encourage your child to go forward because nobody has ever encouraged you. You never dealt with that. So therefore, you will pass that on to your children. You understand? So it's, 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 it's really, really dangerous, something that we need to deal with. Yeah. And that's why people need to be made whole. Yes. Because, um, you know, the Bible talks about um, um, two becoming one as it relates to marriage as such. And I remember the uh, Miles Monroe, the deceased, he usually would have said, persons should not look to get married until they become a whole person. Because if you are not whole, when you go into a marriage, you are going into that marriage, um, should I say, let me put this to a halfway person. And if you go into a marriage, and, and sometimes because you're going into a marriage, you are dependent now on somebody or the other person who you go into that marriage with to make you whole. And that's not how it can happen. You have to go and take your whole self and connect with somebody who is also whole. Because when two whole persons meet, that is how they can now develop that kind of oneness. But if you come with half, and I come with half, I am, if you take your half and you point into me, then I, you, I leave you empty. So you find it takes two whole persons to make a, a successful life and marriage. And as you rightly said, if persons who are coming from the, the school system, coming from homes, go through the school system, become an adult, and then look to get into a relationship with someone and raise children in that environment, they are setting up the children now um, to be placed in a position of disadvantage if they don't allow themselves to become whole and understand what is necessary for them to be able to help children to be raised in the right kind of environment. And we've seen this happen time and time again. It's like a cycle. You go through some communities and you just see some things happening. It's a cycle going over and over again. And you would wonder who is going to break the cycle? Who is going to, it's like a generational curse that has to be broken. And somebody has to break that and decide that I'm going to make a difference. And so yes, the curse can be broken and that cycle can cease. But it has to come. There's only one person who could do that, and that is Jesus. Because the level of wholeness that we need to experience is God who makes us and formed us. I remember God, um, David, speaking in Psalm 139, and he says, You know, you formed my paths, my intricate, you know, every single thing about me, you know, every single aspect of my being, how I function. And so, because God knows everything, He has the ability now. You know, there's the uh, a poem, should I call it a poem or a fable? How can we call it that? Um, a long time when I was growing up, you hear this thing about Humpy Dumpy. Yes. Right? And so we talk about Humpy Dumpy sat on the wall. I think I heard BB and CC made a song about that. Humpy Dumpy sat on the wall, uh, had a great fall, and all the king's horses and king's men tried to put Humpy Dumpy back together. But it was saying that none of them who tried could have put it back together. And it's a good um, thing to reflect on to understand. It does not matter who might be trying, you cannot depend on people to make you whole. There's only one source, there's only one person you can go to to make you a whole person, and that is Christ. And that is why our Christian life is supposed to bring us into a place. When I get saved, I am supposed to allow my connection with God to so affect my life that I allow Christ coming to live in me to allow me to become whole. But I must be, as you rightly said, I heard you said earlier, I must be willing to so yield myself to him, submit myself to him because God will only work with what I give him. And if I don't give him everything, Paul, that's what I love about God. Eh? And I was saying that to someone not too long. I love this thing about God. There just might be something I might not be able to say to my wife. And there might be nothing more or less I don't think I can say to her. But there just might be something that I might not be able to say to her. But you know what? I can tell God every single thing. Every aspect, everything that I'm concerned about, I can tell him everything. Lord, my hand is hurting. Lord, my feet is hurting. All, any area of my life, I can tell him everything. And I can come to him and place my life in his hand and say, God, you fix me up. You make me whole. You put me back together. 
I can depend on men or people to put me back together because they may not even have the right understanding as to how to put me back together. But God has what it takes to put me back together and make me whole as a person. And so it's interesting, I, I love this discussion again, I get into some discussion <laughs> that I really appreciate as such. And um, we are getting in that place where our time, uh, there's another area, I, we, as I said, we wouldn't finish it. We also find that persons who are emotionally um, broken and they're still in the persons who have been broken, we also find that they struggle with fear. They are not confident. Um, this represents another type of emotionally crippled people. They are filled with an overwhelming fear of failure. It is said of them that they are afraid of losing the game. And they take a simple way out. For instance, persons who are so afraid, they decide, you know what? I just wouldn't bother to play. Because I may fail anyway. But if I don't play, you will never see me fail. So I, I'm staying in this safe zone. This safe zone is don't play. So I will not fail because they're expecting themselves to fail. And a lot of people live like that, expecting to fail. Could you speak to that particular subject, my dear? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, as you were speaking about that, Pastor, I recall again like, my own personal experience. Fear of marriage, you know. My father left my mother with the promise that he's going to return. He went to the States. So he left her with the return of two kids. You know, promising that he would have returned, but he never did. You understand? And as a child growing up, I always promised myself that it's going to never happen to me. I don't want no husband who's going to go be in another country, number one. And number two, I don't want that kind of thing to happen to me, that fear of failure. Because I used to see my mom crying. I mean, she tried to be a strong woman. But of course, and then for my own, you know, as an individual, me too, I cried. You know, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to go through that. And I didn't want my children to go through that. You know, so I had that fear. And that was about insecurities as a, as, as a young woman courting, you know. So that, that, that fear of, you know, my husband is going to leave me one day in marriage you understand but then I had to surrender even my marriage that whole idea of marriage that concept of marriage to God I remember having these conversations with God and you know God said to trust him you know and trust means giving up you trust means letting go of those fears you know I used to be real insecure pastor as a teenager I remember quoting and I used to be well insecure as an, as an individual but I as I asked God I said Lord if I have these insecurities help me to deal with these insecurities again you know laying it down at his feet and I don't, I don't want to make it sound as if it was perfect that it was perfect for me because it was never perfect for me it sounds as if it was perfect but this is how I did it you know I found myself going before God time after time after time using his word you know allowing his word what his word says about me to transform my mind continuously and even up until this day that's what I do you know to, to whenever I have my fears and my insecurities or whatever the situation is, my weaknesses, my temptations, whatever it is, I go before God and I cry out, Lord, give me the grace. Lord, give me the strength. And I speak his word over my life. And that is what gives, and again, it doesn't happen immediately. It's not an instant machine like KFC, you go and you get to um, KFC one time. It's not like that. It takes time. But it takes time with your willingness to cooperate with what God's word says about you, you know, to allow God to work in you. And over time, over the process of time, he gives the grace, he adds the grace, he gives you the strength to have that faith and that confidence that you need. Yes. That's true, my dear. And um, I see we are out of time. <laughs> And uh, we have uh, a few minutes left here for us. And uh, we will pick up on this subject again because you know we need to talk about the struggle of insecurities. We have not really brought, there are several solutions, about four of them. And I may not be able to delve into all of them now. But I can tell you one of the things that you must do is what you would have said there. You must confront it. You must face the reality. Accept the fact, Lord, I have this struggle. And I need some help. Go to him and be willing to go. You know, Jesus um, spoke to a gentleman in St. John chapter 5. And the Bible says this gentleman was sitting by this pool there for 38 years. And he was just there in that place. And uh, when Jesus came to that pool after 38 years, he asked the gentleman, 
do you want to be made whole? And I am so amazed at the question Jesus asked the man, because as if I think it probably should be a rhetorical question in the sense that um, um, that's the reason why I'm sitting here. I want to be made whole, that's why I'm here. But Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? And he started by saying, Lord, um, I don't have nobody to take me to the pool when the water is troubled at this certain time. And, and that's what a whole lot of people do. They understand they're broken. They know that they're broken. And yet they want to be made whole. But sometimes what they tend to do, they find a way to make excuses. They find a way to hide things. They find a way to keep things. Uh, they, they seem to, 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 to allow themselves to come to a place where they uh, celebrate their crippleness as it were. They are crippled and they celebrate that. Because why? They're looking for the self-pity of people. And they seem to love and appreciate. Somehow people's self-pity give them a sense of comfort. But if you live on people's self-pity, you will never be made whole. In order for you to be made whole, you have to realize that I don't want self-pity from people. What this gentleman needed at that pool was not self-pity from Jesus. He needed a miracle. He needed to be made whole. When Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? And he started making all those excuses. Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? And then, of course, Jesus spoke to him and says, but if you really want to be made whole, there's something you have to do. He could not have decided, I have to wait for people to take me to the pool. Jesus said, you want to be made whole? Then this is what you need to do. Take up your bed and walk. You take up your bed. You do something about it. Until you do something about it, that's the only time you will be made whole. And so I'm saying to you tonight, you who are listening to me, you cannot stay in that place and depend on people to help you. I know you've been crushed. I know you've been broken. I know you're going through all kinds of stuff. I know the pain of going through that sense of feeling a uh, lack of esteem, where you feel people don't care, you're living in fear. All kinds of problems and challenges you're going through, emotional disturbances and place where you are right now. But I want you to understand that if you don't choose to do something about it, you will stay in that place for the rest of your life. And you must decide, just like that prodigal son, he spoke to himself, you know what? I know my father has so much hope. I will arise and I will go to my father. You must decide, I will do something about it. And when you choose to do something about it, then you're now stepping in the right, the right direction. Because I want you to recognize, the only time you will discover God's supernatural power is when you, you decide to rise up and do something. And somewhere in the midst of you moving to do something, you will discover God's supernatural power is going to work for you. And the same bed that once you was carrying you, you will now be able to carry that bed as that gentleman. The same thing that you used to allow to be uh, to carry you, the same fear that was carrying you, the same um, things, props that you used to carry you in your broken state. Now you will find yourself in a place where those things that you want was once carrying you, you will now be able to carry those things because you find the help that God alone can give you. He alone can give you that help. Jesus can heal broken hearts. He can restore. You might be church worshiping, praising, blessing God. But I want you to know there's a master who can make you whole. And he can make you whole right now. If you will only open up your spirit, right there where you are, we will pray and we will believe God. That the anointing, the glory of God is going to come on you, touch you right now. And it's going to cause you right now to experience a supernatural touch from him where you will be able to experience wholeness in your spirit. So Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for all those who are looking at us, and all those who are reaching out now broken where they are, broken from all kinds of experiences, broken from abuse, broken, Lord God, my Father, from being left alone, broken from in a place where they felt lonely and they felt purposeless, they felt useless, broken from all kinds of experiences. But tonight, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I release your healing power to heal them in their emotions, to heal them, oh God, in their place of pain. I call them for to rise now in Jesus' name. And I say to them, be made whole in the name of Jesus. Lord, I break every generational curse and I speak deliverance over their lives by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Any closing words from your sister, Janelle, that you would like to leave with the folks uh, before sister?
God richly bless you. There is hope and that is found in Christ Jesus. Make him your refuge, make him your fortress, make him your hiding place, and he will heal your brokenness in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. We're from World Changes Assembly, situated at number seven, Flanders Street, New Lands Village Beach. Glad to have you viewing with us. Feel free to make contact with us, 7860952, all the numbers that you can see on our Facebook page. God bless you. Have a great night, everyone.